It's August 6, 2023, and today I get to figure out what all these mics sound like. My name is Jim. I'm a musician in Nashville, and I tend to be around a lot of microphones, but I don't actually know anything about them. I do know there are some mics that cool studios have that were used on cool records, and if I wanted to get one, it'd be like $30,000. And I want to know, what am I missing out on if I only have mics that cost hundreds of dollars, or even tens of dollars? I've made videos trying to figure out where the tone comes from in guitars and amps and cabs with some other fun stuff in between, and now my mission is to figure out where the tone comes from in a microphone. But what does it actually take to create a fair comparison between microphones? I can't just sing and play into the mics back to back because that's not the same performance. I can't just sing and play into the mics side by side because they're not in the same spot. I can't just use a guitar cab because it doesn't cover the whole hearing range, and I can't just use a studio monitor because the bass and the treble won't be coming from the same angle. What I can do is take this old crate combo cab, cut scrap wood to fill the gaps, cut a hole in it, and drop in a thing that's a little treble speaker in the middle of a bigger bass speaker. And now I had a thing that could play enough of the whole hearing range the same way every time into every mic. And that should make for great comparisons. If I can make sure the mics are actually all in the same position, which is embarrassingly difficult to get right over and over. How about a picture frame? If I put it on a pair of skis that hug the sides of the test cab, then take some fishing line and make a target, then that guarantees every mic is going to end up in the exact same spot, left to right, up to down, and front to back. This is my homemade precision mic testing rig. Corey, check it out. I made a custom mic testing rig. Cool. So this lives in the kitchen now? The amount of work it took just to get this far made me realize that actual fair comparisons between microphones must be incredibly rare, because I've never met anyone else who's done this. So what microphones should I test? Well, my favorite music was recorded with the mics at studios like Station West in Ocean Way, Nashville, so I wish I could test those, but I should probably start with the mics that are already in my house. When I was a kid, I started liking the sound of country music, but most people my age didn't, so if I was going to record a song that sounded like I wanted, I had to learn how to do a lot of it myself. I don't spend money on beer or restaurants, and I drive the same car I had in high school, so once in a while when I had extra gig money, instead of that stuff, I'd buy a microphone for vocals, or my guitar cab, or my pedal steel amp, or acoustic guitar, or inside the kick drum, or outside the kick drum, or the snares, the toms, the hi-hat, and the overheads. So these are my microphones, and I needed some audio to blast out of my testing rig into each mic, so I created some audio. I played and recorded all of those instruments to make a full range, full band loop, and chopped it down so the comparisons could be quick and identical. Now let's answer some questions. Do different mics sound different? All right, different mics do actually sound different. It's really special to be able to hear their differences side by side, but I can also play a sweep test from the rig into each mic and the computer can make a graph out of it, which by itself isn't that useful, but if I put two or more mics on the screen, it can show exactly how different they are from each other. I just have to pick a holy grail mic to be the flat line on the graph that everything else gets compared to. But which one is the holy grail? The instinct is to want to compare things to the most perfect possible mic. That's what the microphone companies do when they come up with the squiggles in their manuals. The idea is that they're comparing their mics to something that sounds so neutral, it's as if a microphone isn't even there. But when I'm trying to record something, I'm never choosing between no microphone and a microphone. I'm choosing between whatever microphones are in the building. So I'm going to make the first useful mic comparison graphs ever by saying something that nobody else has ever said. This is an SM57. This is flat. Everyone in the world will tell you it's not flat and that it has a bump here and a roll off there, just look at the squiggles in the manual. But culturally, this is flat. It's $99 new, it's been out there for over 50 years, it's one of the best selling mics of all time, and was still the best selling mic of the year last year. Every rehearsal, every show, and every session I've ever played has had a dozen of these laying around. This is the sound our ears have heard and our brains have understood as what a microphone sounds like by default. If you play me a chunk of audio that was recorded by an SM57, then play me the same chunk of audio recorded by a different mic, I will now know what the other mic sounds like. It would not be sputtered with gold. That's the mic of a carpenter. You've chosen wisely. And now let's answer some questions. How different does a big tube mic sound from a 57? 
How different does a tiny pencil condenser sound from a 57? What about a different kind of dynamic mic? What about a kick drum mic? How different do 57 sound from each other? This is all really cool and useful stuff to know that I didn't have any way of knowing before doing this, but I wanted to dig a little deeper and ask the question, why do these different mics sound different? It was at this point that I got an email from the CMA, the Country Music Association, saying they liked my videos and wanted to sponsor what I was doing, and I've always turned down sponsorship offers. I usually just write my PayPal email on something silly I've made, but I used to sit cross-legged on the floor looking up at the CMA awards show on TV every year and watch the performers sing and play songs I loved, and that kind of thing led to me wanting to move to Nashville and actually try to do this, and I have. So CMA has some new video series on their YouTube channel, including In Their Boots, which follows along and profiles many of the talented people behind the scenes of country music, The High Notes, which sits down with country music icons, up-and-coming artists, stagehands, tour managers, and all the people who make country music what it is to see how they prepare for the day before a career milestone, and Music To My Ears, hosted by singers, songwriters, artists, performers, label executives, producers, and fans as they break down lyrics and reflect on country music throughout the decades. And CMA cares so much about people finding and enjoying the videos they're making that they're paying me a pile of money just to talk about their YouTube channel in my video. They have a pile of money's worth of confidence that the people who like what I do are going to like what they do. That's pretty committed. And the link to CMA's channel is in this video's description. So now I have a pile of money. I've never had one of these before. This opens up a whole world of things I can do. I could finally fix my door handle. Actually, nope, I'll worry about that later because I've heard that tube mics are warm and solid state mics are clear and I have no idea what that means. But I do know my big gold thing is a tube mic made by Lawson in Nashville and Lawson sells mic bodies without tubes that are also compatible with their capsules. So I bought one. Now if I test the same capsule with a tube circuit versus a solid state circuit, how different do those sound? Huh, but what about all the stuff people say about cool, old, well-built American tubes versus the newer, cheap, poor quality ones? Well, I've never opened up this mic before, but it looks like it has an RCA6072USA. Is that a cool tube? I looked it up, and yes, that is a cool tube. But I needed something to compare it to, so I pulled a couple random tubes out of the back of my reissue Fender Twin. How different do all these sound from each other? But what about transformers? Are they giving the mic any extra warmth or punchiness or whatever? I don't know, but I do know that I can test an SM57, open it up, disconnect the transformer, wire it straight to an XLR cable, and test it again. How different would that sound? I think it's important to point out that I've been taking the time to exactly level match everything because in 100% of situations the mic will be going into a mic preamp and the mic preamp will be turned up or down in amount that makes sense and then mixed on faders it will be turned up or down in amount that makes sense. The lowest output mic in the building could be the loudest mic in the mix because the original output level of the mic will be corrected for and made irrelevant twice. The only thing that matters is the tone coming from the microphone. So while things like tubes and transformers can cause the volume of the mic to be lower or higher, once that gets balanced out, the difference in tone is exactly what you just heard. Hey, it surprised me too. Continuing the search, it's not super common, but sometimes a mic does have EQ designed into the circuit, consciously, with the goal of affecting things in the middle of the human hearing range, and one of them is this. So I tested it, opened it up, disconnected the EQ, and tested it again. How different does that sound? So it seems like aside from when there's EQ purposely designed into the circuit, the tone of the mic must be coming from something to do with the capsule and what's physically going on around the capsule. And the circuit just does a pretty good job of shooting everything out through the cable into the preamp. Unless the circuit gets overloaded and distorted. So how do you figure out when that's going to happen? Sorry, David. Wait until I
saw the sun. Shotguns and barbed wire fences! Now let's answer some questions. Which mics distort in which scenarios? So first thing I noticed was that the dynamic mics never distorted, even in the loudest situations, so I don't have to worry about those. But then it gets more nuanced. The condenser mics distorted on the kick and snare, so the circuit probably matters there. Only two of them distorted on the twin crank to 10, so it's possible that in some scenarios the circuit matters there. And for overheads and vocals, only one of them, the cheap over-bias tube mic, distorted. So it's actually not likely that circuit would matter there in most cases, even with a condenser mic. And then for acoustic, none of the mics distorted. Even though I reamed on a bourgeois banjo killer, named for its loudness, with the mic right up on the body, closer than an acoustic mic would usually be placed. And there's something very exciting that I can do with this info. I happen to have first-hand evidence that one of the mics used to record my favorite acoustic guitar sounds was a Telefunken 251 at Ocean Way, Nashville, which is a $25,000 vintage tube microphone. But since it was used on acoustic guitar, and that mic doesn't have any EQ in the circuit, I'm not hearing the circuit. I'm just hearing a clean signal from the capsule. So theoretically, I wouldn't need a $25,000 vintage tube mic to get that sound. I'd just need basically any mic body with a capsule that has a similar frequency response. And I didn't have any way of knowing what the frequency response of Oceanway's Telefunken 251 is, but when I looked up what kind of capsule it would have, this guy said it's this kind, and I wanted one. When I searched the internet for microphone parts, I ended up at microphoneparts.com, and I could get a kit with a simple circuit and that style capsule for under $400. And I'm just a performer, I don't know anything about building microphones, but... Happy learned how to putt. Uh-oh! <laughs> Now let's answer some questions. First, two mics, same capsule, different circuit. How different do they sound? Second, two mics, different capsule, same circuit. How different do they sound? All right, but these mics do have different grills. I know grills on dynamic mics with foam in them can affect the sound. But I didn't know how much the foamless grills on a condenser mic changed the sound, so I tested a ton of things. Alright, so it seems like as long as you're pointing the mic at the thing you want to hear and the grill isn't literally blocking sound from getting to the capsule, which none of the condenser grills look like they're doing, then the sound just goes right through. That pretty much just leaves the capsule making the mic sound like it does. But I've heard that cool vintage mics, even with the same type of capsule, can sound different from each other. Meaning the capsules either changed over time or weren't made the exact same in the first place. And this might be my last hurdle, so I wanted to figure out what changes the sound in a capsule. And after successfully building four microphones with no prior experience, I rode that wave of confidence and started messing with them, making sure I didn't do the thing where the screwdriver slips and destroys the diaphragm. Hey, I did the thing. Look, I did the thing where the thing slips and then it breaks the diaphragm. That's crazy. <laughs> but then I realized something. You know what? Actually, how big a deal is this? How different does this sound?
extremely interesting. The broken diaphragm didn't wreck the mic. The mic still worked, and it didn't even sound that different. But two things were very clear to me. I wanted to know what affects the sound of a condenser capsule so I can understand where the sound comes from in those cool $30,000 vintage mics that were used during the making of my favorite records, and I don't have the knowledge, skills, or equipment to do it myself. But this guy does. This is Preston White. He lives in Nashville, and he builds and repairs vintage mics for my favorite studios. So how does a mic capsule work? So this is a condenser mic capsule. It's a little smaller than a double stuffed Oreo cookie. It has a metal back plate with holes in it, then a very thin air gap created by one of these spacers. On top of that, a very thin plastic diaphragm with a microscopic layer of gold on top of it. And finally, a ring with screws that holds it all together. And usually, it's the same on the other side. When sound hits the diaphragm, the diaphragm moves back and forth and the back plate stays steady, which turns into an electrical signal in the wires, which then goes through the circuit of the mic, out the cable to the preamp. And what things might change the sound of a capsule? Things like the size of the air gaps, the diaphragm thickness, the diaphragm tensioning, the amount of gold sputtered on the diaphragm, how the back plate is drilled. Has anyone ever tested those things? Not that I'm aware of. Can I pay you to make a bunch of slightly different diaphragms so we can figure out how much each of those things affects the sound? Sure. Now let's answer some questions. Can the sound change if the polarizing voltage is different? What about diaphragm tension? What about the number of screws in the ring? What about gold thickness? What about mylar thickness? What about the spacers? <sighs> this little Oreo is not simple. I stared at these graphs for three days and some things still didn't make sense, but I was able to find one big trend. Each thing we tested contributes in some way to the capsule's total capacitance, and that's a big word I barely understand, but when I lined everything up in order from lowest to highest, this happened. So, regardless of every other individual difference, as the capacitance goes up, a wide dip in the low mids gets bigger, a narrow peak in the upper mids gets bigger, and a dip in the high treble gets bigger. And remember, this was all done with the same capsule, just tweaking small things about it. I was happy to know more about how that stuff actually works, but also a little bummed out, because it shows that even if I bought the same model of microphone as my heroes used to make my favorite music, there's no way for me to know if I'm actually getting the same kind of sound. The only way for me to know what real studio mics actually sound like would be to walk through the front door of the studio where that music was recorded with my big silly rig and test the actual individual mics themselves. This is Station West Studios in Berry Hill. My favorite music was overdubbed and mixed here, and I spent a day in Studio A with my testing rig and access to all of their microphones. Now let's answer some questions. Sometimes sessions at Station West will have a Cascade Fathead ribbon mic alongside a 57 on guitar cabs, so how different do they sound? Sometimes a Yamaha subkick gets used on Kick Out. What does that sound like? I usually see 421s on all the toms, but at Station West, they use an Audix D2 on the high tom. How different are those mics? The SM7B is a pretty common vocal mic, so what does it sound like? And it also has really low output, so some companies make an accessory that's supposed to make the mic louder and the tone better. And these definitely make it louder, but if the loudness is matched, how different does the tone sound? What if I take that big foam windscreen off? 
I've seen Lewitt mics make their way into the consciousness of Nashville engineers more lately, and the thing I've heard about is how they have both tube and FET circuits, and you can choose one or the other or blend them, so you can supposedly get the best of both tones. And tests I've done so far makes me question, how different does a Lewitt mic sound on tube mode versus FET mode? Okay, yeah, that's kind of what I expected. And Station West has five AKG solid tube microphones. That's a budget model from the late 90s that very few people seem to care about, but one of them, the one labeled DB, was actually the lead vocal mic on my favorite music. So how do the five solid tubes sound compared to each other? Without going to these crazy lengths, I never would have had a way to know this, but out of all five, DB had the most unique sound, with less bass than the others. It was really cool to get to learn more about one of the actual mics that made such an impact on my life. But some questions were still there in my head, unanswered. What about all those mythical, unattainable museum pieces that all the cool engineers seem to cherish and use on major records, like vintage Neumanns and Telefunkens and AKGs from the 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s? All the ones that cost tens of thousands of dollars, I still didn't know what they sounded like. Let's get started. This is Ocean Way Nashville Studio A on Music Row. This is one of the biggest studios in the world. My favorite music was tracked here, and I got to spend an unbelievable day in Studio A with my big silly test rig and access to all of their microphones. It's August 6, 2023, and today, I get to figure out what all these mics sound like. <laughs> now let's answer some questions. This is every test I did, referenced to an SM57 and aligned in the middle at 1K. I'm not much of an adjectives guy. When talking about tone, I usually don't get anything out of someone saying a piece of gear sounds rubbery or creamy or whatever, but there are four words that actually can be used to describe how something sounds, and that's brighter, darker, fatter, and thinner. Pretty simple. And anything more specific than that doesn't have words and requires actual numbers to be called out. So let's chip away at the things that sound the most different from a 57, starting with the darkest and fattest mics, which includes the Royer ribbons, the vintage ribbons, and the NS10 speaker wired backwards. Then the thinnest mics are the omnidirectional ones and a couple old dynamic mics that were broken. Then some of the most different sounding mics are the kick drum mics. There were a couple weird old ones, but these are the two I've seen most, and turns out their bass and treble peaks are in different spots. With those gone, the brightest mics left in the upper mids are the old and new versions of the Sennheiser MD421s, which I learned do actually sound different from each other. The brightest mics in the high treble are the small diaphragm condensers, or pencil condensers. Now some of the crazy expensive vintage ones. The Neumann 47s and 49s were fairly consistent, but the Neumann 67s and 87s were all over the place. as were the AKGs and Telefunkens. There was so much variance here, it's hard to define a sound for any of them, but it does look like the AKGs tend to be a little brighter than the Neumanns up here. Then there were the SM7s with and without foam. and the Sennheiser 441, then the Sony C800G, and the working Electro Voice RE20s. And then the rest are all 57s. I never knew what any of those mics actually sounded like, and it feels really good to have a grasp on what they'll do if I pick one of them. But now the real reason I did all this. My favorite music was tracked at Ocean Way, and then overdubbed at Station West.
the signal chain for JT, I mean, it was literally a 57 into the Neve. That was it. If I'm going to care at all about how my microphones sound, then I guess I'd like them to sound like these. So how close am I? I'm pretty happy with where I am when it comes to mics. I was really surprised about how something like this homemade blue and silver mic could sound so similar to one of Oceanway's $25,000 vintage Telefunk and tube mics. So to take my microphone journey to the absolute extreme, leaving nothing left on the table, I did one more test. This is the pop can. I bought it at a grocery store. I took it out of its packaging, opened it, drank what was inside, then drilled holes in the top and bottom and made a grill out of hot glue and a window screen. Then I went on Nashville Craigslist, searched the word microphone, and bought the cheapest condenser mic available, getting something that is the most mass-produced, most corner-cutting thing imaginable. I took it apart, used its circuit, and replaced its capsule with a Mic Parts RK12 like my blue and silver hat. Everything up to this point had been helped significantly by the pile of money given to me by CMA for talking about their YouTube channel. And now, the pop can is sponsored by my PayPal email address. I'm having so much fun figuring out how music actually works, and if you like what I'm doing and want me to keep going, send me a couple bucks and I'll fix my door handle and continue making videos. So, in this final microphone comparison, any differences you hear will be the culmination of all the differences between new versus old, boutique versus mass produced, high quality components versus low quality components, tubes versus no tubes, transformers versus no transformers, a purpose-built grill versus a window screen, and a purpose-built body versus a pop can. Any similarities you hear will be the frequency response of the capsule. After six months of testing microphones and doing things I'd never seen anyone else do, I feel like I have a better idea of what my priority should be every time I plug a microphone into a preamp. Which makes me wonder, where does the tone come from in a mic preamp? Hopefully you'll join me in the future for more videos. Mm -hmm.